So there is a challenge in telling stories with data because we aren't dealing with one piece of paper. We don't have the luxury of inventing right from scratch. We're dealing with often quite complicated, quite messy information. We're dealing with constraints in terms of our own methods and processes and our own desires to be seen as rigorous and credible in terms of the way that we communicate the information out to the business, to our colleagues, to stakeholders, to the outside world. So what I want to talk about today is how it is possible to combine the two, to be able to get better at telling stories to help have more impact with people without losing the element of what makes us a great researcher and analyst. So keeping that core element of yours makes us rigorous. So that's my mission today, and to give you some practical, practical hints and tips to take away to do that. But before I do that, I want to share a story with you. So last summer, I ran a number of workshops with a local government organisation, and that organisation was full of performance analysts, researchers, insight professionals, and they were working through stories from specific pieces of work they were working on. And over the course of the day, they were generating material. And this is an example of one of the things that they were able to create. Does everybody know what this is a picture of? Yeah, excellent. It is, it is. That always helps. Yeah, this is Where's Wally. So one of the teams I was working with came up with this Where's Wally picture. And this was a visual metaphor to help them to communicate a problem they were facing within the vulnerable adult sector. So this county council had noticed there was a problem with how systems and processes and agencies don't speak with each other, literally, in terms of verbally, but also in terms of the systems that they have, and how it was the potential was, as you find with Where's Wally, on every page you start from scratch and you have to start finding him again. And okay, you've got some visual cues to work from in terms of his outfit, but essentially you're starting from scratch each time. Every time a vulnerable adult within their county was coming into the system, they were being, we were having to look and care for them differently each time. And the camera up with what is a great, simple, and quite light-hearted metaphor for what is a very serious subject, where there's massive inefficiencies and also the potential to quite literally lose people in the system. Now, the reason I'm sharing this example is not necessarily because that is a great metaphor in itself, but because while we were creating this story, the person in the team who was actually responsible for this piece of work and not at all. So all the way through, they were coming up with this idea of keep getting all sorts Okay, what are you doing? And it started. And then the giggles kept on going. And so when I challenge why the giggles, it's like, this is great. I think it's great. We've come up with this in the workshop. It's a great metaphor for what we're trying to do. There's no way on earth I'm going to be going into a meeting with senior policy decision makers and strategists and giving them a look at what's why. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not comfortable with doing that. I'm not going to be allowed to do it. So this is all great, but I'm not going to be able to do anything with this. Now, fortunately, his boss was in the room and challenged that assumption that you're not allowed to do this. So actually, we give, the whole point of doing this is we're giving you the permission to think differently about doing things. Actually, I'm going to suggest that you do do it now that you've said that, and actually go out and communicate to the business using this concept and see if you can get some traction on essentially what is this problem and the fact that we need to get closer to talking to the, to the various different agencies. The reason I share this story is because the biggest obstacle to us telling stories with data is not our innate creativity as analysts, seeing it as being left brain, right brain at all. It is not necessarily about being given that permission to communicate in that way. It's our confidence. It's a confidence thing. And actually, if you get over that first hurdle of trying it and seeing that the world doesn't collapse, and actually we can help get a story to land with the audience, then it starts building some momentum. So a lot of what I spend my time doing is getting comfortable with that first step and saying, what can we do and how are we going to build your confidence to go into a walk, walk into a boardroom and actually start with the Where's Wally book rather than wheeling out the potentially 100-page presentation that was already prepared. So that's, that's, that's something to leave you with. A lot of this is the barriers we put up are not necessarily real to doing storytelling with data. They are more self-constructed by our own confidence. 
So what do I mean by an insight story? So everyone's had their favourite person to reference. This diagram reference the person I'm going to talk about, and that is Aristotle. So in terms of the art of persuasion, there are three components that make us effective communicators. And Robert touched on some of these already, so I'll, I'll whiz through and then talk about how we actually make this happen in reality. So the heart represents pathos, empathy, emotion, Robert talked about a lot in detail. And th these are the things that we need to feel, and we need to feel them because without that feeling, we're not necessarily motivated or mobilised to do anything about it. And that do something about it might be just to think about it, to talk to other people about it, to make a business case, to change something. We need to feel something in ourselves to make that actually happen. The second image, the brain, represents logos. So rational argument, nice clear message, something really powerful that stands out in terms of something I can understand to the point of what you're actually saying. And then the third one, the rosette, is as a community and as industry, as researchers, insight, evaluators, as a profession, we put a lot of emphasis on trying to communicate by demonstrating our credibility. It's our safety net, it's our comfort blanket. Because we have all of this lovely data, and most people, I believe, Despite all of the failings, I still believe a lot of the people that are invested in creating facts are doing so from a very pure perspective. But we've put a lot of emphasis on pushing that out and thinking that's going to make a difference to the detriment of the other two components. So I'm not suggesting we dump that. So going to, to the question around uh, in, in terms of are we dumping things down, I, I absolutely don't believe we have to. So Patrick's point was, does it, we're still good researchers, analysts, when we do these things. What we actually end up delivering doesn't mean that we haven't done the hard work. And even if we deliver something simple, it doesn't mean the hard work has gone away. We now have the beauty of being able to store all of this information. We don't have to throw it in people's faces. I believe the layering approach where people can dig deeper if they want to and find out more information, go to the original source. We have the technology to enable us to do that. We don't need to throw it all out there straight away from people. So for me, it's more about dialing down the data overload to give the room to breathe in terms of the arguments we're trying to make and to engage with people on an emotional level. So, but how do we do that? So when we're sitting at our desks and we're looking at our computer, at something we need to get out there, what do we actually do to make that happen and get us over? So for me, from a heart perspective, there are some simple things that you can think about. It is that high impact stuff. Patrick talked about using it in terms of uh, what they have on Facebook, thinking about those first three seconds. That, that, that's how journalists have always thought about how do they engage people. We need to have that mentality as well. So what are some of the titles and the hooks that we can grab people in? A lot of the stuff that I look at is very descriptive. It's very rational. Uh, it is um, quite source-based. And it's not necessarily engaging in its own right. It doesn't mean it's not valid as a source. But it's not the engagement hook to grab me in in the first place. What stories can I tell? My own stories, customer stories, consumer stories, stories that you have available through your research to actually bring the points you want to make. That n equals one sample is becoming much more powerful. And as long as you're not over illustrating a point that takes you away from the average, or you're not playing out one point of view over another you are doing a really good job. And I, I think we've got so wedded to the idea of the, the mean in data that actually we do a disservice to research will stop. If you took the mean answer to every survey and then went out to try to find that person answer to the mean, that person doesn't exist. Or it's very highly unlikely that that person exists. So playing around the edges with individual stories can be really, really powerful, pulling apart some of the nuance of what is actually going on behind the scenes of our data. Metaphors, such as the one that I, that I shared with you, uh, the mountain metaphor is great as well. So we've already seen that quite a few metaphors today, which again, there's shortcuts for people in their brain. If they come to you and quickly and intuitively, they will to your audience too. So they're nice shortcuts for the point you're trying to make. Scenarios, painting, just painting pictures for how things could be or would be is a nice way of illustrating the points you're going to make. From a rational perspective, I think we need to get better at 
having a strong narrative structure. It's really easy when you've got lots and lots of data to get lost in that very, very quickly. So making sure that story thread runs through. But there is a very clear set up in terms of why you're talking and telling this piece of communication. There's a reason, a compelling reason for people to want to listen and do more. And that you're getting to a point in a story resolution around the recommendations that you're actually making. And for me, finally, the credibility and why we don't lose ourselves in that credibility is we need to do more interpretation, much more synthesis. Yes, pull out the killer stats of the art, but think about how you synthesize all of those findings together to come up with something. And actually, simple diagrams, models can be a really nice way of taking what essentially could be on 100 pages of PowerPoint charts into one point. And the reason I put these on, uh, on post-it notes as a visual is what I get people to do and which I urge you to take away and start thinking about doing is what I call the three post-it note challenge. So anything you're working on, remove yourself from it for a point in time and give yourself three post-it notes and force yourself and constrain yourself and say, if I've got three post-it notes and I've got to get one that's actually a hook that's going to engage people in this in the first place, what do I pick? What is the actual core message of this? And can I say it in two sentences? If I'm forced to do it in two sentences, what would those two sentences be? And finally, if I only had to show one piece of evidence or chart, what would that be? And force yourself to do that. And actually, by constraining yourself, it becomes quite easy to do. At the moment, the luxury of time means that all of the evidence means we could do anything. And we have to force ourselves and constrain ourselves to, to come up with those things. That will then affect what you then pull behind it. Now, I'm not suggesting you only go into meetings with three post-it notes. And I'm not suggesting that even if you did go in with one page with all of that stuff, and the other stuff doesn't need to still be there. It still exists. You just need to get people to want to read it in the first place. And some people will, and some people still won't. And they'll be happy enough with that one page. But that is still a job done. I think there's something in the fact that we've spent a lot of time on this stuff. You know, we want people to read it. want to be emotionally attached to the stuff that we've created. So I urge you to try the three post-it note challenge. But when thinking about embedding this as an approach on a more day-to-day -day basis, there are a few things that will be enablers to help do this within your teams when you go back to kind of the branch. And the first thing is collaboration. It is so much easier to do this when you've got multiple brains. Trying to come up with some of this stuff yourself can, you, you're, you're making yourself feel um, under pressure. And actually sometimes that fresh perspective, when people have no idea about what you're actually writing about, can actually really stress test whether your message actually makes sense, whether the visual you've picked for your message makes sense and so forth. So collaboration for me is key. The second thing I would say is in labour is step away from the computer. So we have become so busy that we're do, do, do mentality, and a lot of that is done in the computer now, that no amount of staring at a spreadsheet or charts is necessarily going to make some of this stuff happen. It's not going to make the metaphor cut naturally pop into your head. It's conversations, it's through reading widely, it's through listening and observing the world around you. That's where that richness comes from. And to do that stuff, you need to free up your time. So the third thing I would say is, the last thing you should be thinking about is how do I actually execute this? It could be I end up having to do a PowerPoint, it could be I create a video, it could be I do what um, we're going to speak about next in terms of the visualisation, but don't let that lead you to do the thinking first. So I advocate working in draft for as long as you possibly can and then think about how you have to execute it and get that message right from the first place. So thank you very much. I think I'm done for time. So yeah.